Twisted Metal Small Brawl is the absolute worst Twisted Metal game, and it isn't even close. That is a sentiment you tend to hear quite a bit online. Or at least as I was getting into the franchise, that was the sentiment I heard quite a bit, especially from online publications. To be fair, to the uninitiated who are just glancing at these games without any other context, there is a very good reason for Small Brawl to be considered the absolute worst. I mean, look at it. I think it speaks for itself. But it's a case where I think if you dive beyond the absolutely incredibly stupid and juvenile presentation, there's actually a game in here that is not only very good, but is perhaps arguably one of the best games in the series. But let's slow down for a second. What's the story here? Well, 989 Studios took over after Single Track walked away from the franchise, but now this is the year 2001. 989 Studios as we knew it is dead, and now at least a good chunk of the team who made the original Twisted Metal games, including Scott Campbell, have walked away from Single Track after it started eating itself alive. Now they've gone on to form Incognito Inc., or Incognito Entertainment, or whatever it's called, a spiritual successor to their previous incarnation, and they wasted no time in getting the Twisted Metal franchise back, at which point they started making two games pretty much simultaneously. Black, and the subject for today, Small Brawl. Despite Black coming out before Small Brawl, I feel like Small Brawl sort of feels like the true end of the era. Mostly because it's the final of the five Twisted Metal PS1 games that came out. So even though Black came out before Small Brawl, I feel compelled to cover this one before Black. I mean, thematically, it's also somewhat more similar to the previous games than Black is, because the series up until now seemingly was split right down the middle as far as darkness and lightheartedness. Different games landed on different parts of the spectrum, but with Incognito's output in 2001, they basically broke that scale in both directions. Twisted Metal Black got the morbid elements, and Small Brawl got the colorful, lighthearted elements. And the results will vary from person to person if either of these work for them, and I would be a hypocrite if I took issue with the tone and presentation of the third and fourth games and didn't take issue with the same things in this game. Thankfully, I'm not a hypocrite, though. More or less. Because the tone and presentation of Small Brawl is easily the absolute worst part of the game. It's so childish and goofy as to be straight up Asa 9, 10, and 11. It's been a while since I've had to break that one out. So here's what's up. The neighborhood bully Billy Calypso, who looks like Sid from Toy Story if he was blonde, saw some demolition derby on TV and was inspired to do it himself. However, despite being a punk, he's still a kid, so he antagonizes a whole bunch of neighborhood kids into joining his RC car-based demolition derby tournament. He steals Mortimer's frog, he pushes Axel down a hill, and so on. You should be able to guess the rest. The last person standing will get whatever they want. How he got the resources to do any of this, or the powers he's implied to have, I have no idea. More than anything, there's one thing that kind of confuses me about this whole setup. If Billy Calypso's entire idea hinged on his own desire to do a demolition derby, then why isn't he part of the tournament? Previously, he's always been this omnipotent being who specifically ran the tournament for his own personal gain, but there's no personal gain here. So you gotta wonder what he gets out of this if he's not competing. Maybe there's something I missed in the manual, who knows. Or maybe he drives the final boss piecemeal. I mean, they never specified whether or not he didn't, so that's a decent headcanon, I guess. But anyways, given the fact that this is essentially twisted metal but kidified, you have various adaptations of fan-favorite characters, Mortimer, Mr. Grimm, Sweet Tooth, Outlaw, and so on. Larger-than-life personalities brought down to Earth, each with their own wants and needs. Granted, even though the tone is definitely childish, this is still the same company that wanted to include a cutscene where a baby got drowned before Sony stepped in, so there's still some morbid themes in these cutscenes. Even for as short as they are on average. I think the average cutscene length is actually shorter than even Twisted Metal 3. But to be fair, all the cutscenes are unique, so I'm not gonna complain. I'll talk more about the endings themselves in a minute, though the short cutscene length does kind of build into this really low-budget feeling this game has. It has a very distinctly late-era, low-budget PS1 quality to it that's kind of hard to articulate, but you know what I'm talking about if you've played a lot of low-budget PS1 games. Basic loading screens, a very static menu screen, the way you exit loading screens with absolutely no ceremony, whether that be to go to the main menu, the gameplay, or the save screen, it's just load, 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 then pop. 
then you have a severe lack of voice acting or anything that would drive up costs. I've seen this song and dance before, and this is clearly a game they wanted to make as cheaply as possible. I mean, the game's graphics are alright, it's basically about as much as you could expect for the PS1, and these levels are relatively detailed for the most part. So I can't fault them on that front, despite other aspects of presentation being definitively weak. So the theming and tone are off, the presentation is distinctly cheap, so what is there to like about this game? Well, all those aspects of the game are ultimately minor in the grand scheme of things. Aspects that can make a good game great, or a great game fantastic. Especially for a gameplay-based genre like this, the game needs to be fun first and foremost, and for my tastes, the engine they use in Small Brawl is one of the best game engines they've ever built, making this one of the most technically satisfying games in the series. You see, the irony is, the previous two games ostensibly had you driving real vehicles, but it felt like you were driving RC cars, whereas the actual game that has you driving RC cars feels almost viscerally real. Like, the entire game engine feels straight out of a Gran Turismo game for the time, because the vehicles feel like real vehicles insofar as they could feel like real vehicles at this point in gaming. They have so much weight and presence within the game world. Everything about this just feels right. Now, there's only so many ways I can reiterate that sentiment, but that's the God's honest truth. The way this game controls feels heavy in a way the series has arguably never felt. The way you accelerate quickly but not too quickly, and shift speeds relatively organically. The way you shift and slow down as you turn or power slide. The way you fly into the air, it all feels pretty legit, but importantly you also always feel in control. The mechanics feel arcadey in the sense that there's no chance of you spinning out or doing anything drastically unintentional in your car. And when the controls feel this intuitive and this precise, keyword there is precise, it means you have no handicaps. Everything about this game is down to your skill and nothing else. None of the game's challenge comes from the game not doing what you want it to do, which is exactly how it should be. One added touch that really builds into this is the way that the cars will lean and shift in accordance to where you're traveling. You don't really realize until you have a point of comparison, but one of the things that made the cars in the previous two games feel so weightless is the fact that they were completely static. They didn't move, shift, or react to the world around you at all, even while flying around. So it added to the sense that you were a small plastic toy with no moving parts, on top of the fact that you felt so weightless to begin with because of how floaty that game engine felt. Whereas actually adding the visual detail of having these cars actually shift and react to how you're driving, it makes these cars visually operate exactly how you understand cars to do so. Giving you a visual indication on how you're maneuvering and what's the optimal way to navigate the levels. It's an unnecessary touch that adds so much to the experience. Furthering that sense of realism that's so important. With that said, Small Brawl is generally slower paced than the other games, arguably a bit too slow paced. I feel like the ideal speed is definitely Twisted Metal 1 or 2, where it's fast but you still feel in control. It was a little chaotic, but it was controlled chaos, whereas I feel like the element of chaos is somewhat missing in Small Brawl. So there's definitely been a trade-off where this game feels a bit more restrained, and maybe turning the speed up an extra 25% would make the experience more enjoyable. But on the scale of necessity, I prefer actually feeling in control over things being too chaotic, and it's not like this game is too slow-paced in my opinion, I think the pacing is perfectly fine. But there's still definitely the argument to be made that this game does go too far in the realism direction, so if you find this game is not as fun as the previous games simply for the fact that it doesn't feel quite as fast-paced, then I understand. And even then, I do have some issues with the engine, such as how near as I can tell it's basically impossible to flip over. Let me get something straight. I don't mind the ability to flip over, it's all about balance. Ironically. How easy it is to actually do so. Taking the mechanic away altogether is a bit drastic, but I guess that's all part of the trade-off. This game may be different compared to the other games in the series in ways that you may not like, but you know, those games aren't going anywhere, and I appreciate the fact that they were able to do something so unique. It also must be said that this might be the most polished game of all the PS1 games. Never once did I clip through a ledge or get caught up in scenery. Everything is solid that needs to be solid, and nothing in the levels operates other than how they're supposed to. It's all around a solid game engine that I enjoy. But what would a game like this be without the content to back it up? 
You can definitely tell that when Incognito Entertainment got Sony to sign off on both Black and Small Brawl, Incognito wanted nothing to do with the third and fourth games, because not a single character that was introduced in either of those games made the cut. Despite there being quite a lot of characters to choose from. So you end up with many of the most well-known characters, a who's who of greatest hits. Of course, they have some unique additions, namely Mime, Trapper, and Piecemeal. The latter two of which are the campaign bosses, making this somewhat rarely a twisted metal game that allows you to play as every introduced character without hacking. It's definitely a good roster of characters, though one of the interesting things to note about the character stats in this game is that they don't give you the attack power of your special as a stat. Which is good, because there's so much that goes into a special attack that a quantifiable stat is kinda pointless. But what I've seemed to notice is that the characters with the most health tend to have very short ranged attacks. It's not universal, but that tends to be the case, whereas lower health vehicles tend to have long ranged attacks, or at least have a short ranged attack that's hard to dodge. But one thing I appreciate is that they weren't content just recycling concepts from previous games, so almost every returning character has new special attacks. Even Axel's, whose Supernova Shockwave is probably the most iconic attack in the entire history of the series, has been replaced. Now he shoots a missile and then spins like a madman, dropping bombs in all directions. It's an odd attack to say the least, but effective. Then you have Sweet Tooth, who will fire what I think is supposed to be an ice cream bar, but on closer inspection it looks for all the world like a bar of soap. However, it acts like a more powerful version of the Ricochet. Or Mr. Grimm, who will fire two pumpkin bombs like he's the Green Goblin or something, or Shadow, who will fire a semi-auto-tracking Reaper that also acts as a remote bomb. Probably my pick for the best special attack in the game. But I'd say all the special attacks have their uses, even the ones that would otherwise be useless in other games. Looking at you, Ram. And I would say all these characters have their uses as well. Normally this would be the part where I tell you the best characters to play as, but if I'm being honest, you could probably play through this game as any number of these characters without much trouble. Definitely the ones with the most health and wait for ramming are the ones that you can get through the easiest with, but I never found any of the characters to be true duds. But that's also partially for a slightly negative reason. If you held a gun to my head and asked me what the worst part of this game is, I would definitely say the difficulty, which seems to be the universal issue with a lot of these games. I feel the only game in the series that I didn't take issue with difficulty-wise was the first game. That was the only case where there was no asterisk. Small Brawl's issue is that it's far too easy. It's entirely possible to get through the entire game on medium or even hard without dying a single time, especially if you use a vehicle with higher health. I can't point to any specific aspect that makes the game feel easy, there's just a lot of little things. The enemies aren't that aggressive, the healing items will respawn too often, and there's usually enough of them per level that there's always at least one kicking around somewhere, so basically I never died. I pretty much exclusively play on medium for most games because that's a very good gauge of understanding where the difficulty lies. And after doing so for most of my time playing this game, I can say with certainty that this is the one game in the series where I would recommend that new players start out on the hardest difficulty. Because otherwise it's not a stimulating challenge whatsoever, outside of the bosses that is. I kept having to run away and restock my weapons because I kept running out of anything worth a damn, but they are genuinely challenging which I appreciate in a game that can be as easy as this one. With that said, even though there's only two bosses, they do vary in quality for reasons that go beyond whether or not they're actually challenging. Trapper, I feel, would be a much worse boss had the game's mechanics not been as good as they are, but he's a powerful enemy with a unique special attack where he fires monkeys at you that will split off and multiply. Plus, the arena is pretty good. They split Mini Golf Mayhem in half and have you fight him there, which is a good idea considering that Mini Golf Mayhem is one of the biggest arenas in the game, so having the entire thing for a one-on-one -on -one fight would be pretty obnoxious. So they sectioned it off into the best parts of the level, which is exactly what they should have done, making this a very solid boss, one of the best in the series in fact. Piecemeal on the other hand is a boss fight that not even the best mechanics in the world could save, because this boss fight gives Arduous a whole new meaning. There's a good reason for that. From what I understand, the game was a bit rushed towards the end of development, and they didn't do everything they wanted to do with the final boss. Apparently they wanted piecemeal to be an amalgam of all the defeated cars in the final level, like all the cars would Voltron together into a supercar and that would be the final boss, but then practicality set in and they had to make severe compromises. 
So instead, you fight in an arena with four enemies, and every time you kill one of the enemies, piecemeal shows up and you have to take out a quarter of its health bar. More than anything, this makes the action really stop and start. Just as you're getting into a good groove of fighting and flanking, he pisses off back to the ethereal netherscape that he occupies whenever he's not there. Plus, it basically guarantees that you're never going to be ready by the time he shows up. And since he shows up whenever you kill an enemy, you could have two enemies that are at really low health and then die relatively close together, or you could have an entire separate battle between stages of the boss fight, basically meaning that it's completely inconsistent as to when you're going to have to fight him. So they might as well have just made it a consistent fight to begin with. This boss fight would have been more fun if you could just fight it flat out. Plus, unlike the mini golf mayhem level where you fought Trapper, you fight piecemeal in Now Slaying, which is one of the worst levels in the game. It's a giant square with a ramp between two flat points at the top and bottom of the arena, with a platform in the front that you can blow up using this popcorn cart. So it's a really boringly designed level, meaning you don't even have the benefit of having the fight take place in an interesting environment. But on top of that, the weapon selection in Now Slaying seems to be more limited in that I was constantly having to wait for weapons to respawn in order to attack piecemeal with literally anything, making the fact that piecemeal has so much health become a real liability. It's just a poorly made boss fight all around if I'm being honest, which I can't hold against the developers too much because of the conditions they were in, but that doesn't make this boss fight suck any less. It's also very unfortunate that Piecemeal is not a very good character when you unlock them. It's the embodiment of this one meme. It doesn't even have a special attack, it just copies the special attack of whatever car is nearest to it. It probably uses other people's specials in the boss fight as well, but I never really noticed that because the boss fight has other issues. Once again, this is probably down to crunch, but I wouldn't mind so much if the mime character didn't also have the exact same thing where it copies other people's special attacks. If they didn't have time to give a dedicated special attack to piecemeal, they really should have just cut mime altogether and given mime special attack or special ability or whatever you want to call it to piecemeal because it only puts a spotlight on how slapdash piecemeal is when you're recycling concepts from the very game it's part of. It's a shame that the game ends on a relative stinker, considering that pretty much the entire rest of the game's levels are actually really good. In fact, this might be one of the more consistent level rosters in the entire history of the series. One of the things I love about this set of levels is that they're all basically distinctive without needing to go completely over the top with the gimmicks. Take Treetop Rumble, for example. This is a level wherein you have a series of bridges that connect four treehouses and you have a trampoline in the middle. Meaning that if you fall down on the inside, you'll bounce up and end up at another part of the level. Giving more room for tactical gameplay, the likes of which you rarely see in these games. Then you have things like Meet Your Maker, which is a multi-level stage with several different gimmicks strewn throughout that could do any number of horrible things to you. My favorite is this weird meat grinder mechanism which will kill you in a second, so if you trick people onto this conveyor belt and freeze them, you can very easily kill them that way. Ending this round very quickly, but the multi-level design in itself is very interesting and makes for a lot of unique occurrences. Easy Death Oven is another case where you have a dual layered level with a lot of stage hazards but not so many that the level gets cluttered. It keeps things interesting and doesn't get in the way. Plus, you can open up a secret area by firing Napalm into the plumber's butt. I have no words. Th that is either awesome or completely stupid. Possibly both. Then you have the aforementioned Mini Golf Mayhem, which is this level with a bunch of individually sectioned off areas built around one central gimmick, such as a volcano, these crushing spikes, a pyramid, and so on. Plus, if you knock the golf balls into these holes, you get a free item. It's not the only level that does something like this. Potentially the best level in the game is one that's not even available by default, which would be Buster's Lanes. There's a lot to like about this level. It has multi-level design that's fun to explore, it's big but not so big that it gets in the way of the fight, and there's a lot of fun set pieces and design. But the best part for me is the fully functional bowling minigame that will give you items for knocking down all the pins. It's completely superfluous, but it's an added bit of detail that was completely unnecessary especially for a secret level because there's no guarantee that players were going to find it, but it just shows the amount of effort on display here despite being a lower budget game on an at the time previous gen console. 
even the lesser levels more often than not have at least something going on, like the Carno Mall level, which theoretically would be pretty boring design-wise, and yet it has these fun little set pieces that enhance the experience, such as this spinning plate, or an entire sequence of back rooms. Granted, it's not all aces. Gridiron Gore, Shock Therapy, and Playground Peril are all somewhere between boring and completely standard, but even then, I don't necessarily hate those levels because a lot of the content in these games are only as fun as the game itself, so these are perfectly serviceable, if slightly boring levels. So overall, this is one of the more consistent level sets in the history of the series. Definitely a compliment to the action more often than not. I think the one thing that would have put this game over the top as far as differentiating itself would have been a unique set of weapons that fit the setting. Which they sort of did. They took the concepts of the weapons from the previous games and altered them to fit the style such as making the missiles fireworks, which is by no means something that I hold against the game, but I do wish they would have introduced a few more unique weapons. If I'm not mistaken, the only unique weapon in this game is the Roman Candle, which is completely unlike any sort of Roman Candle I've ever seen. It operates more like a bouncing ball weapon that explodes on contact with an enemy. Yep, that's not a Roman Candle. That's probably not even a Greek torch. So they didn't add much, and they also took some stuff away, because once again, they reshuffled the deck as far as the combination attacks, and this time we only have, like, five. But hey, they also went ham with the environmental attacks, which makes up for the lack of unique weapons somewhat. Some of these are really cool, such as activating the volcano in Mini Golf Mayhem or speeding up the conveyor belts in Meet Your Maker, which once again was really funny for getting people caught up in the meat grinder. But not every level has such an obvious thing to make an environmental attack out of, so you have some lesser ones, such as Easy Death Oven, where it'll just shoot ice cubes out of the fridge, which I've never seen hit anyone. So the environmental attacks are a bit of a mixed bag, but once again it really shows how much effort they were putting into this game despite it being a budget title. Granted, in all honesty, there are quite a few things about this game that could be considered mixed bags. None more so than the character endings, which are easily the most mixed of mixed bags. Like, Sweet Tooth's ending is one of the best endings in the entire history of the series, really showcasing how you scale the character concept down to being a barely sentient child while still maintaining the same level of sinister villainy. And all you can think of is a little ice cream? <laughs> As far as miles per gallon, this cutscene is the most efficient a character has ever been shown to be a badass evil son of a bitch that I've ever seen, and I love it. Tricks Billy into thinking he only wants a bit of ice cream, then ties Billy to the front of an ice cream truck and goes for a joyride. I can't possibly do justice to how cool that is. And there are some other decent to good endings, such as Mortimer, aka Shadow's ending, where Calypso decides to give back Mortimer's bullfrog that he stole at the beginning of the game, and Mortimer alludes to radiation exposure, which opens the way for the bullfrog to mutate and eat Calypso. That's pretty funny. Or Spectre, who's looking for his father, gets a locket which alludes to his father being Ken Masters from Twisted Metal 2, and he even finds the car he drove, which is a nice little easter egg. On the flip side, you have Hammerhead's ending, where he wishes to become a rock star and ends up being the front man for a boy band. Those aren't even remotely the same thing. Crimson Fury, which ends up being a really cringeworthy James Bond parody, or Twister, who gets shot into space in a really predictable way. Matter of fact, one of these endings was considered so bad it was actually cut from the game, that being Axel's ending. Let's just say it was a mean-spirited joke without a punchline at the expense of a character who was a paraplegic. Would these endings be better if the subject matter wasn't inherently eye-roll worthy? If the presentation wasn't so childish? Absolutely, but that's the name of the game. So much of Twisted Metal Small Brawl does come back to that theming. And it has its moments of true brilliance where it's able to subvert the childish, cringe-worthy presentation and become surprisingly sinister. But it's still outweighed heavily by the cringe. But at the end of the day, all the other aspects of this game need to bow to whether or not the game as a whole is fun. And simply put, Twisted Metal Small Brawl is plain uncomplicated fun. The game engine is one of the best they ever made, despite many aspects of this game being completely asinine. 
so I can't help but enjoy this game. And I feel like if you avoided Small Brawl based on its premise, I'd say you should give it a chance. And if you tried it before and didn't like it, I'd say you should give it another chance. This is definitely a game that didn't warrant its low Metacritic score at the time, or its designation as what is commonly considered the absolute worst game in the series. Not when Twisted Metal 3 and 4 exist. Would I say that Small Brawl ranks extremely highly in the grand scheme of the series? Well, that depends, because there are games in the series that have all the positives of this game and none of the negatives, so I'd say that Small Brawl is somewhere in the middle of the pack, but it's a pretty competitive field. Once you get past 3 and 4, it's not a particularly wide gap in quality between the third worst and best. So the true cream of the crop needs to do everything right, so I definitely wouldn't place Small Brawl at the top of the rankings, but traditionally, this is the game that places dead last, usually by craptastic wannabe news journalism sites who have no knowledge of the series and just want to get a few clicks. Oh yeah, and are usually ripping me off! And that's an undeserved fate, because Twisted Metal Small Brawl is great. You guys are just mean. That's all I've got. If you like what I do here and want to support the channel, you can like this video, leave a comment telling me what you think, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. And if you want to support the channel in a more direct fashion, you can pledge to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, exclusive content, Discord benefits, and more, along with these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to Billy Not Brooklyn, Chase Cranford, Ga004, Layabout, My Name is Tank, Raf, Ty Trovi, Weird Webster, Ty Trovi, and Weird Webster for going above and beyond. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Stay crispy, my friends.